Well, we know a whole lot about neurons now, right? We know the different parts of the neurons. We know about those different proteins that are in the cell membrane. And now you know why. I'm always thinking about proteins. We've also learned that the entire cell, dendrites, cell body, axon, axon terminus, the whole cell sets up a resting membrane potential with sodium potassium pumps and potassium leakage channels. And we know that it's just the axon and the axon terminus that does the action potential. It does that with voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels. I did not talk about the voltage-gated potassium channels. They won't be on the exam either, but if you're a person who needs to know the whole story, you may want to read about them as well. What I'd like to talk about now is, well, what opened up the uh, first voltage-gated sodium channel? Well, what was happening there? I just said, oh, okay, now the membrane uh, voltage changes. Well, well, what changed it? And the answer is graded potentials. What opens that first voltage-gated sodium channel? Graded potentials. If they sum up to the point of what is known as threshold. Now, here we need to start thinking about synapses. At the very beginning of this set of lectures, I told you that we have to be thinking about cells, not one neuron at a time, because it doesn't make any sense. One neuron at a time is like one cell phone. It makes no sense. Who would want one, right? The only time cell phones are useful is if lots of people have them and they're connected to each other. The only times what we're talking about with neurons is useful is when they're connected to each other. So how are they connected to each other? By synapses. The name of the connection between a nerve cell and a muscle cell is called the neuromuscular junction. You probably remember that from 150. But we're just going to be talking right now about synapses from one neuron to the next neuron. So we will see the axon terminus is going to come in contact with either a dendrite or the cell body of the next neuron down the line. Now, this is important. Information will go from the upstream neuron to the downstream neuron, its dendrite or cell body, information will not go backwards, well, not directly, okay? So information is going this way or going this way. By the way, information will not go this way either, okay? So there are sending cells and receiving cells. The sending cell is called the presynaptic neuron. Let me get a pen out. The sending cell is called the presynaptic neuron, presynaptic neuron, because it's the one before the synapse. The synapse is where they come in contact. So this is going to be the sender of the message. The postsynaptic neuron is the receiver of the message. And what is the form that the message will take? The message is being sent by communication molecules called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. And the word neurotransmitter is unusually long. I did not think it would be that long. Neurotransmitters. Okay, so a synapse is where the axon of one neuron, technically it's axon terminus, it's synaptic bulbs, meets the dendrite or cell body of another neuron or where the axon of a neuron, its axon terminus or cell body, um, meets a muscle cell. Or there are other uh, examples, right? So synapses. So an action potential, a nerve impulse, is traveling lickety split right down this axon. And when it gets to the end here, here's the end, it is going to cause the exocytosis of neurotransmitters into the space between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. Or you could say it is going to be re releasing, exocytosing its neurotransmitters into the synapse or into the synaptic cleft. Those neurotransmitters, are, they're just molecules. They're not usually uh, proteins, but uh, they're just different types of molecules. You will find, particularly those of you who go on into a medical career, you will find that there are molecules like oxytocin 
that is considered both a hormone and a neurotransmitter. And you will say, what up with that? Well, the reason we call something a hormone is because it's released by a cell and goes into the bloodstream and it's a communication molecule. So when oxytocin is released by the posterior pituitary and goes into the bloodstream to be a communication molecule, then it's called a hormone. But if a nerve cell releases oxytocin into a synapse, then magically that exact same neuro, that exact same molecule now would be called a neurotransmitter because neurotransmitters are released by nerve cells into synapses. Okay. So when we also will sometimes describe a molecule as being a protein or being a lipid, then we're describing its chemical structure. So there's, there's different ways that we can describe molecules. All right, so synapses. Now, ooh, pretty, okay. So over here, this is just some artist's imagining of this cell that is synapsing with those cells, and then this cell is synapsing with all of those cells, right? Everywhere the end of an axon, its axon terminus, comes in contact with the next cell, that's a synapse. And when we're talking about synapses and later in this lecture, we'll kind of be looking at is, well, what if two different cells come in contact with one cell body of the postsynaptic cell? What would happen then? The truth is so much more complicated than that. This in pink, that is the cell body of one of your brain cells. And in blue, those are the synaptic bulbs of other presynaptic neurons. And in your brain, there are usually more than a thousand presynaptic neurons all yelling at each postsynaptic neuron. In other words, every postsynaptic neuron is listening to information from about a thousand or more presynaptic neuron. And each one of them is saying, here is good information, please send it along. Or some of these guys, like this fellow over here, might be saying, that is bad information, do not send it along, okay? And the job of the postsynaptic neuron is to decide, who do I believe? And am I convinced? Now, in a, in a very real sense, I think of every cell body of every neuron as being like, um, as being like you while you're on, I don't know, Twitter, okay? When you're on Twitter, you're getting information from lots and lots and lots of different people. Some of it you will retweet, but not all of it, right? Why is that out of all of the people that are tweeting, why is it that some of it you retweet and some of it you don't? That's the same thing that's going on here. In this analogy, you are the cell body. You are receiving lots of neurotransmitters from different uh, twi tweeters. <laughs> and you're getting that information and you are needing to sort out is this good information or is this not good information? Some of it you will retweet. If the cell body decides to retweet, they send out an action potential. So we will be talking now about ligand-gated channels. Ligand-gated channels are found on the dendrites and in the cell body. Remember that if if ligand-gated channels were found on the axon, we'd get graded potentials on the axon. We don't get graded potentials on the axon because we don't have ligand-gated channels there. Same thing with potassium uh, voltage-gated channels. Voltage-gated channels cause action potentials. We don't have action potentials on the cell body or the dendrites, so we don't have voltage-gated channels there. Now we're talking about ligand-gated channels. What causes a ligand-gated channel to open? A neurotransmitter. There I am writing out neurotransmitter again. The neurotransmitter acts as this little pyramid 
ligand that when it binds to the ligand gated channel, it causes the channel to open. Now, what is allowed to go through that channel does not depend on the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is just a key. You put it in the door, it opens the door. What goes through the door, that's up to the door, not up to the neurotransmitter. Ligand gated channels are opened by chemicals called neurotransmitters. Okay. So here we've got an example of a chemical synapse. We're not, we're not, good, we're not going to be talking about electrical synapses until we get to the heart. Okay? Almost all the synapses are chemical synapses. Yeah, almost all of them. Okay, so here's the end of an axon. Here's the, this is the axon terminus, and here's the synaptic bulb. That action potential arrives. And when the action potential arrives, it actually opens up a different kind of voltage-gated channel, and the opening of that channel will stimulate the, the end of the axon to, um, to exocytose neurotransmitters. So these little brown balls in there, those are neurotransmitters, and they get exocytose into the synaptic cleft. Uh, acetylcholine is a good example of a neurotransmitter. It's the neurotransmitter that works wherever nerve cell touches a muscle cell, right? It, it works in other places too. So that's just an example. So here is going to be, wrong, here is going to be our closed ligand gated channel. When the ligand, that's the little brown uh, acetylcholine, when it binds to the ligand gated channel, it causes it to open up, right? And you should write this down, that the presynaptic neuron, when an action potential will arise there, it will exocytose neurotransmitter into the synapse, and that will be received by ligand gated channels on the postsynaptic cell and ligand gated channels are only found on the dendrites in the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron, right? Oh, next, okay? So when the uh, ligand gated channel opens, then it will allow ions to go through. Now, we're gonna talk about two different kinds of ligand gated channels. There are ligand gated channels that let chloride go through and ligand-gated channels that let sodium go through. Whether chloride or sodium goes through is actually not dictated by the neurotransmitter. It's only dictated by the kind of channel that the ligand bound to. So we are going to start there at the beginning of our next video.